An arc flash is an event occurring during an electrical fault or short circuit that passes through a physical air gap or bridge between two electrodes. Arc flash incidents are deadly and can cause severe harm to the people and equipment involved. Arc terminal temperature is estimated to be in excess of 35,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The surface of the sun is only 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The tremendous temperature of the arc caused the explosive expansion of both the surrounding air and the metal in the arc path. The superheating of the air during an arcing incident creates an acoustic wave similar to the generation of thunder by lightning. The arc blast created can propel large objects, personnel, switchboard doors, and bus bars several feet at high rates of speed. The explosion from an arc blast creates a wave of intense pressure that can send equipment parts flying like shrapnel at more than 700 miles per hour. Arc blasts can provide enough pressure to collapse lungs and rupture eardrums if hearing protection is not used. The sound created is 64 times louder than a passing freight train. There are different levels of PPE required depending on the calculated incident energy of an arc flash. While PPE can be an important safety measure, it should be noted the best way to protect yourself from an arc flash hazard is to de-energize the electrical equipment before working on it. There are four arc flash boundaries that are calculated to help determine the level of bodily harm you could sustain based on your physical distance from an arc flash. Boundaries are determined through arc flash studies or using PPE category method tables. The arc flash boundary is the first boundary. It separates an area in which a person is likely exposed to a second degree burn injury from an area in which the potential for injury does not likely include a second degree burn. Arc flash burns may still occur outside the arc flash boundary, but they should not be second degree or worse. The onset of a second degree burn on unprotected skin is likely to occur at an exposure of 1.2 calories per square centimeter for one second. Calories per square centimeter is also known as calories or cal. The second boundary is the limited approach. This shock protection boundary is the approach limit for unqualified employees and is intended to eliminate the risk of contact with an exposed energized electrical conductor or circuit part. Unqualified persons are only allowed to enter this boundary if escorted by a qualified person. The third boundary is the restricted approach. This shock protection boundary is the approach limit for qualified employees. If the qualified employee crosses the restricted or post boundary, they must be protected from unexpected contact with the conductors or circuit parts that are energized and exposed. This picture shows the approach boundary distances for a 600 volt MCC. The arc flash boundary is a distance at which the incident energy equals 1.2 cal. An incident energy of 1.2 cal is expected to limit your injury to one that is recoverable and non-permanent. This does not necessarily mean that an injury sustained at this energy level will not result in your hospitalization. The arc flash boundary is 5 feet, limited approach boundary is 3 foot 6 inches, and the restricted approach boundary is 1 foot. Table 130.4 DA in the NFPA 70E defines shock protection approach boundaries to expose energized electrical conductors for alternating current systems. The table shows nominal system voltage in column 1, limited approach boundary in column 2 and 3, and restricted approach boundary in column 4. This table, along with the NFPA 70E, can be found in the safety reference job in Procore. NEC and NFPA mandated labels help inform about the dangers of an arc flash and requirements and should be looked at prior to opening the panel door. This picture illustrates two possible configurations of equipment labeling. An employee is not expected to calculate an incident energy value. However, employees should be capable of reading and interpreting the information included on an arc flash hazard label. Labels should contain nominal system voltage and arc flash boundary. Labels should also include available incident energy and the corresponding working distance or the arc flash PPE category for the equipment. An incident energy and a PPE category should not be on the same piece of equipment. Only one method of risk assessment may be applied to a piece of equipment. The label on the left contains incident energy and the label on the right contains PPE category. The method of calculating and the data to support the information for the label shall be documented. The data shall be reviewed for accuracy at intervals not to exceed five years. Where the review of the data identifies a change that renders the label inaccurate, the label shall be updated. The owner of the electrical equipment shall be responsible for the documentation, installation, and maintenance of the marked label. Arc flash incidents can be caused by the accidental slip of a tool, insecure connections in the electrical equipment, improper installation, broken moving parts, dust, animals, bugs, corrosion, oil, grease, or other impurities. Any of these factors can act as the catalyst a current needs to jump from one conductor to the next. 
and arc flash is brighter than the sun and can cause severe skin damage and blindness. Even if you are wearing safety glasses, the brightness of the light can cause immediate permanent blindness. An arc flash causes a very loud sound by quickly moving air or a sound wave that can reach 140 decibels at a distance of just 2 feet. Standard earplugs typically protect only up to 105 decibels and you can go deaf from the intense arc flash sound. Employees interacting with energized electrical conductors and circuit parts can be exposed to an unacceptable risk of injury from electrical hazards. This exposure can result in an electric shock, injury, electrocution, arc flash burn or thermal burn, injury from the molten metal, shrapnel or pressure blast, or secondary injury as a result of a fall or from trying to avoid the exposure. The NFPA 70E, Standard for Electrical Safety in the Workplace, provides enforceable responsibilities for employers and employees to protect against electrical hazards to which an employee might be exposed. The purpose of the NFPA 70E is to provide a practical, safe working area for employees which is safe from unacceptable risk associated with the use of electricity in the workplace. The NFPA 70E and important charts and tables can be found in the safety reference job on Procore. The NFPA 70E handbook adds commentary and tries to explain some of the sections of the NFPA 70E standard. The handbook also contains pictures. We will now look at definitions from Article 100 of the NFPA 70E. An arc flash chute is a complete arc rated clothing and equipment system that covers the entire body except for the hands and feet. Hands and feet must be covered by adequate arc fault protective equipment as shown in the picture. Employees shall wear rubber insulating gloves with leather protectors where there is a danger of hand injury from electric shock due to contact with exposed energized electrical conductors or circuit parts. Employees shall wear rubber insulating gloves with leather protectors and rubber insulating sleeves where there is a danger of hand and arm injury from electric shock due to contact with exposed energized electrical conductors or circuit parts. Rubber insulating gloves shall be rated for the voltage for which the gloves will be exposed. Heavy duty leather gloves or leather protectors worn over the rubber gloves are included as arc flash protection. Leather materials are typically not arc flash rated. However, heavy duty leather gloves made entirely of leather with a minimum thickness of 0.03 inches or 1 seconds of an inch that are unlined or lined with non-flammable, non-melting fabrics have been shown to have the arc thermal performance values in an excess of 10 calories. Table 130.7 C7 in the NFPA 70E shows maximum test intervals for rubber insulating equipment. Blankets must be tested every 12 months, gloves every 6 months, and sleeves every 12 months. Arc rating is the value attributed to materials that describes their performance to exposure to an electrical arc discharge. The arc rating is expressed in calories. Arc rated clothing or equipment indicates it's been tested for exposure to an electric arc. Flame resistant clothing without an arc rating has not been tested for exposure to an electric arc. All arc rated clothing is also flame resistant. Although all arc rating clothing is also flame resistant, the inverse is not always true. Flame resistant clothing may not provide adequate protection from an arc flash. Many fabrics including non-arc rated cotton, polyester cotton blends, nylon, silk, and wool fabrics are flammable and can ignite and continue to burn, resulting in serious injuries. Furthermore, non-arc rated synthetic materials such as nylon, polyester, polypropylene, and spandex can melt into the skin from an arc flash exposure, aggravating the burn injury. Significant injuries can occur when fabrics melt onto an employee's skin. Arc rated PPE does not necessarily prevent the passage of thermal energy to the employee. However, properly rated PPE should limit thermal energy level impinged on the employee's body to one that does not cause worse than a secondary burn. This energy level may be sufficient to melt undergarments onto the employee's skin. Therefore, undergarments must be made of non-melting material. An incident quantity of these fabrics, such as those in the elastic bands and underwear, is permitted. A balaclava sock hood is an arc rated hood that protects the neck and head except for the facial areas of the eyes and nose. It fits tightly against the wearer's head and neck and few air pockets exist between the balaclava and the wearer's skin. Only balaclavas having a tested arc rating and calories can be used to meet the requirements of the NFPA 70E. Balaclavas intended for warmth must not be worn as arc flash protection. This picture shows a balaclava sock hood with an arc thermal performance value rating of 28 calories. A barricade is a physical obstruction such as tapes, cones, or A-frame type wood or metal structures intended to provide a warning and to limit access. A barricade might consist of warning tape and cones as shown in this picture. Physical or mechanical field fabricated barriers shall be installed no closer than the limited approach boundary distance. While the barrier is being installed, the limited approach boundary distance shall be maintained or the energized conductors or circuit parts shall be placed in electrically safe work condition. 
The placement of barriers and barricades will often be your duty as part of the performing task. The limited approach boundary distance will not be found on an equipment label. It should be on the energized work permit. If the task does not require a work permit, you must be capable of determining the distance from the appropriate table. Barricades are not intended to prevent approach to an area. Instead, a barricade is intended to act as a warning device. When installed, the barricade should enclose the area containing the electrical hazard. If signs and barricades do not provide sufficient warning and protection from electrical hazards, an attendant shall be stationed to warn and protect employees. The primary duty and responsibility of an attendant providing manual signaling and alerting shall be to keep unqualified employees outside of the work area where the unqualified employee might be exposed to electrical hazards. The attendant should have no other duty than to deliver the warning. Incident energy is the amount of thermal energy impressed on a surface a certain distance from the source generated during an electrical arc event. Incident energy is typically expressed in calories per square centimeter. Predicting the amount of available incident energy is crucial in selecting appropriate PPE. Properly rated PPE prevents injury from melting or burning clothing or from direct skin exposure due to the increased temperature during arcing fault. Using PPE rated above the calculated incident energy value can raise the probability of the employee being protected. A qualified person is one who has demonstrated skills and knowledge related to the construction operations of electrical equipment and installations and has received safety training to identify the hazards and reduce the associated risk. A qualified employee must understand the construction and operation of the equipment or circuit associated with the planned work task. An employee could be qualified to perform one work task and not be qualified to perform a different work task on that same piece of equipment. An employee could also be qualified to work on one piece of equipment but not another similar piece of equipment. Many states and local government licensing programs have training requirements that must be met for a person to be considered qualified. The applicant must be examined initially and then periodically after procuring a license. The license in and of itself does not make a person qualified under the requirements of the NFPA 70E for all tasks or equipment that may be encountered. For example, often the licensing of electricians qualifies them for installing electrical equipment in accordance with the NEC, but may not qualify them to maintain the same piece of equipment. Electrical work requires continuing education and demonstration of the necessary skills in order to maintain the requisite skill level to work safely. A qualified person must understand electrical hazards associated with the scheduled work task and must be able to react appropriately to all hazards associated with the task. A qualified person should be able to understand the risk assessments and the proper application and limitations of PPE. They must understand the limitations of test equipment such as voltage testers, how to select appropriate equipment, and how to apply that equipment to the planned work task. The phrase has demonstrated skills requires that the person must actually demonstrate the ability to perform the task. It may be necessary to demonstrate the ability to perform the task while using appropriate PPE to ensure that the restricted lighting and field of view of the arc flash shoot hood or the dexterity limitations of voltage rated gloves with leather protectors do not hinder the employee. Part of this training is about learning how to select and use the personal and other protective equipment required to perform the task safely. Training may be completed in incremental steps. Once the instructor is sure that the employee is ready, the employee would be allowed to perform the procedure with the instructor close by to help out as necessary. Until the employee shows a level of confidence at the task, the ability to perform the task safely with the minimum ability required in the instructor's opinion, the employee should not be allowed to perform the procedure without the instructor watching close by. However, once this level of knowledge and ability is reached, the employee may then be considered a qualified person to perform that particular task. The employee must know how to safely use the test instrument to perform the required measurement task. This use requires an understanding and capability of interpreting all readings and indications given by the test instrument. It also includes knowing the different settings, limitations, and operating modes of the device, as well as the proper terminal into which leads are to be installed. Retraining is necessary when inspection indicates an employee is not properly complying with safety-related work practices when new equipment, including PPE, or new technology is introduced into the work environment, when new or revised procedures are to be used, when retraining has not occurred within three years, and when requested by the employee. You are the only one who truly knows when your skills are not current or not sharp enough to safely perform a task. Updating and refining your skills can help prevent injury. An unqualified person is any person who has not received the specific training to perform a task or to recognize that an electrical hazard exists and how to avoid the hazard or who has not shown demonstrated ability. 
human error and its negative consequences on people, processes, the work environment, and equipment needs to be addressed. Human factors are generally recognized as one of the leading causes of injuries, and an impaired employee may be unable to perform the task at hand safely. If taking shortcuts, skipping procedures, or routinely breaking rules is not addressed, employees begin to consider their actions as being condoned by the employer. If the employer is aware of these issues and does not promote safety, employees will assume they are permitted to continue the unsafe work practices. By not enforcing the standard, you create a new standard. Employers and employees must realize that an illness or fatigue from extended hours may put the employee at risk. You are uniquely qualified to determine impairments that may prevent you from safely performing an assigned task. You must recognize when you feel ill or are fatigued by an extended shift and acknowledge that continuing in this condition could put you or others around you at risk. The risk assessment procedure shall require that preventative and protective risk control methods be implemented in accordance with the following hierarchy. Elimination, substitution, engineering controls, awareness, administrative controls, PPE. Each risk control method is considered less effective than the one before it. Elimination, substitution, and engineering controls are the most effective methods to reduce risk as they are usually applied at the source of possible injury or damage to health and they are less likely to be affected by human error. An example of elimination is placing conductors and circuit parts in an electrically safe working condition. An example of substitution is reducing energy by replacing 120 volt control circuitry with 24 volt control circuitry. An example of engineering controls is guarding energized electrical conductors and circuit parts to reduce the likelihood of electrical contract or arcing faults. Awareness, administrative controls, and PPE are the least effective methods to reduce risk as they are not applied at the source and they are more likely to be affected by human error. An example of awareness is using signs alerting of the potential presence of hazards. An example of administrative controls is using procedures and job planning tools. An example of PPE is shock and arc flash PPE. Before starting each job that involves exposure to electrical hazards, the employee in charge shall complete a job safety plan and conduct a job briefing with the employees involved. The job safety plan shall be completed by a qualified person, be documented, include a description of the job and the individual task, include identification of the electrical hazards associated with each task, and include a shock risk assessment. The shock risk assessment must identify shock hazards, estimate the likelihood of occurrence of injury or damage to health, and the potential severity of injury or damage to health and determine if additional protective measures are required, including the use of PPE. The job briefing shall cover the job safety plan and the information on the energized electrical work permit if a permit is required. The job briefing and planning checklist is located in Informative Annex I of the NFPA 70E. It can also be found in the safety reference job on Procore under NFPA 70E. The job briefing and checklist can be referenced as needed. The employee in charge must be able to communicate what is required to the employees involved. If the task involved required the skills of a licensed electrician, then it might be wise for the licensed electrician to perform the job briefing. The job briefing needs to be performed before the work tasks are started. However, it should not be performed so far ahead that the employees involved might forget what was covered. The job briefing should include a discussion of the work procedures so that all parties fully understand the procedures before beginning the task. The job briefing also gives employees the opportunity to express any concerns they have about the task, the procedure, and their safety. Send the completed job briefing to your general superintendent and the safety director. You should be aware that additional electrical training may be necessary before you are put at risk of an electrical injury. If you do not feel that sufficient training has been provided to you or that training did not address your specific concerns, you should express the need for the appropriate training before performing the task. Energized work shall be permitted where the employer can demonstrate that de-energizing introduces additional hazards or increased risk. Before authorizing energized work with the justification of a greater hazard, consideration should be given to the result of an incident that may occur. Not only would equipment failure present the greater hazard, but the equipment could be inoperable for a considerably longer time than during a scheduled outage. For example, the proposed justification may be that life support equipment must be worked on while energized. There must be an alternative plan if an incident does occur during repair and the equipment is rendered inoperative. How will life support be maintained when such an event occurs? Another example is a hazardous area ventilation system that may depend on the continuity of electrical power. However, temporary ventilation may be available. Often, the alternative plan provides the reasoning and ability to conduct the work de-energized. In many situations, due to the equipment design limitations, diagnostic work such as voltage or temperature measurement, troubleshooting, and testing of electrical equipment is infeasible to perform without the employee being exposed to energized conductors and circuit parts. With the advent of remote programming and monitoring ports, however, what was considered to be infeasible may have changed. If it is feasible to install a remote programming 
port to program a motor controlled center bucket electronic overload relay, opening the door and exposing an employee to energized electrical conductors and circuit parts may no longer be justified. Energized electrical conductors and circuit parts operate at less than 50 volts shall not be required to be denergized where the capacity of the source and any overcurrent protection between the energy source and the worker are considered and it is determined that there will be no increased exposure to electrical burns or to explosion due to electric arcs. Under normal conditions, electrical conductors energized at voltages less than 50 volts do not present an electrical shock hazard. A thermal hazard can exist in circuits that have a significant capacity to deliver energy even when the voltage level is less than 50 volts. For instance, battery installations can be connected so that an arc resulting from a short circuit could present a significant th thermal hazard. An arc flash event could occur provided there is a large enough battery, even if less than 50 volts, or as a result of a discharge from a capacitor. If an uninsulated wrench is left across the terminals of a 12 volt battery for an extended period of time, it can become red hot and can easily burn skin if touched without appropriate protection. An energized electrical work permit can be found in the informative Annex J of the NFPA 70E and in the safety reference job on Procore. The purpose of a work permit is to ensure that people in responsible decisions are involved in the decision whether or not to accept the increased risk of injury to the employee assigned to the energized electrical task. An additional benefit of the work permit is that its review might initiate a decision to perform the work de-energized. An energized electrical work permit is required and must be documented when work is performed within the restricted approach boundary and or when the employee interacts with the equipment when conductors or circuit parts are not exposed but an increased likelihood of injury from exposure to an arc flash hazard exists. The phrase interacting with the equipment could involve opening or closing a disconnecting means or pushing a reset button. Once energized electrical work is properly justified, the hierarchy of risk controls has been employed and the justified work can safely be conducted. The basic purpose of the energized electrical work permit is to ensure that people in responsible positions are involved in the decision whether or not to accept the increased risk associated with working on energized electrical conductors or circuit parts. An additional benefit of the energized electrical work permit is that its review might initiate a decision to perform the work de-energized. It is a good practice to consider the use of an energized electrical work permit even when one is not required. This demonstrates that proper consideration was given to all aspects required to protect an employee when diagnostic work is being done. Electrical work shall be permitted without an energized electrical work permit if a qualified person is provided with and uses appropriate safe work practices and PPE under the following conditions. Testing, troubleshooting, or voltage measuring, thermography, ultrasound, or visual inspection if the restricted approach boundary is not crossed, access to and egress from an area with energized electrical equipment if no electrical work is performed and the restricted approach boundary is not crossed, general housekeeping and miscellaneous non-electrical tasks if the restricted approach boundary is not crossed. It is a good practice to use an energized electrical work permit even when one is not required. The energized electrical work permit will document the task, PPE, and work procedures that are necessary. An employee conducting voltage measurement without an energized electrical work permit may notice a loose conductor in a terminal and consider that it may need to be tightened. The use of an energized electrical work permit here will remind the employee that the only authorized task is a voltage measurement. Tightening the terminal is a separate task outside the scope of the original energized electrical work permit and could put the employee at risk of an injury for a condition that was not considered. Employees are often reluctant to question a decision by a supervisor that a work task must be conducted while the circuit remains energized. The employer must demonstrate that de-energizing introduces additional hazards or increased risk. Managers and supervisors tend to be hesitant to accept increased risk of exposure to hazards, particularly if their authorization for employees to work on energized equipment has to be in writing. An energized electrical work permit flowchart can be found in Annex J of the NFPA 70E. This flowchart takes you through the decision-making process for energized electrical work. It is solely your responsibility to remain alert and attentive while conducting an energized task. You should not be distracted by cell phones, by other persons, or by other tasks occurring around you. In addition, do not reach blindly into areas that might contain exposed energized conductors or circuit parts where an electrical hazard exists. You must be able to see the location where the task will be conducted. There is no way to assume that the task can be safely performed if you are unable to see what you are doing. The use of a mirror to see behind an obstruction is also considered blind reaching. In addition, you should not attempt to pick up a nut, bolt, or tool that has fallen into equipment, even if it is visible. Retrieving a dropped item inches away from an assigned task location may be a new task that presents additional hazards and greater risk of injury. 
You need to address all hazards and associated risks before deviating from the issued work permit. Employees shall not enter spaces where electrical hazards exist until illumination is provided that enables the employee to perform the work safely. Additional illumination could be required due to the darkness of the face shield. Prior to the start of work, the work area should be viewed wearing the face shield to determine if additional illumination is needed. Conductive articles of jewelry and clothing, such as watch bands, bracelets, rings, keychains, necklaces, metalized aprons, cloth with conductive thread, metal headgear, or metal frame glasses, shall not be worn within the restricted approach boundary or where they present an electrical contact hazard with exposed energized electrical conductors or circuit parts. Doors, hinge panels, and the like shall be secured to prevent their swinging into an employee and causing the employee to contact exposed energized electrical conductors or circuit parts operating at voltages equal to or greater than 50 volts or where an electrical hazard exists if movement of the door, hinge panel, and the like is likely to create a hazard. Employees shall not perform housekeeping duties inside the limited approach boundary where there is a possibility of contact with energized electrical conductors or circuit parts unless adequate safeguards, such as insulating equipment or barriers, are provided to prevent contact. Electrically conductive cleaning materials, including conductive solids such as steel wool, metallized cloth, and silicone carbide, as well as conductive liquid solutions, shall not be used inside the limited approach boundary unless procedures to prevent electrical contact are followed. When there is evidence that electrical equipment could fail and injure employees, the electric equipment shall be de-energized unless the employer can demonstrate de-energizing introduces additional hazards or increased risk or is infeasible. Until the equipment is de-energized or repaired, employees shall be protected from hazards associated with the impending failure of the equipment by suitable barricades and other alerting techniques necessary for safety of the employees. Electrical equipment frequently offers indications that failure is impending and employees shall be trained to recognize these indications. Indications of impending failure can include hot enclosures, unusual noises or sounds, warning lights, and unfamiliar smells. If any of these indications is observed, normal operation of the equipment should not be permitted or attempted. The equipment must be isolated through the use of barricades or similar protective measures to protect employees against accidental contact with the equipment while in failure mode. After the equipment has been isolated, it should be de-energized from a remote location. Disconnecting means located in the equipment should not be operated unless the employee is protected from the effects of equipment failure. PPE does not prevent an injury if an incident occurs. Note that using arc-rated PPE at its rating provides only a 50% probability of protection from a second-degree burn. Properly selected arc flash PPE may minimize the severity of an injury to one that is recoverable, but the employee may still suffer some level of injury. PPE also does not have an arc blast rating and is only rated for arc flash and or shock protection. Arc rated clothing must completely cover all body areas that are within the arc flash boundary. Shirts, sleeves must be fastened at the wrist and the top button of shirts and or jackets must be fastened to minimize the chance that heated air could reach below the arc rated clothing. Shirt sleeves should fit under the gauntlet of the protective gloves to minimize the chance that thermal energy could enter under the shirt sleeves. Tight fitting clothing shall be avoided. Loose fitting clothing provides additional thermal insulation because of air spaces. PPE also does not protect from blunt force trauma. Arc flash and shock protection PPE may not provide protection from an arc blast where, for example, the pressure wave is strong enough to knock the employee off a ladder or into a wall, to project a door or panel into the employee, or to eject shrapnel at velocity high enough to penetrate the body. Safety glasses or goggles protect the eyes from impact that exceed the protection offered by face shields and hood windows. Face shields or hoods are considered as a secondary eye protective device that must be used with a primary eye protective device like a spectacle or goggle underneath. Employees shall wear hearing protection whenever working within the arc flash boundary. Ear canal inserts are the form of hearing protection recognized in the NFPA 70E. They interfere less with the proper fit and application of other PPE intended to protect the head and face. Hearing protection should not adversely impact the performance of other items of PPE. For example, earmuffs worn over a balaclava may not only present additional flammable material, but may not provide the necessary hearing protection. Likewise, earmuffs worn under a balaclava may stretch the fabric beyond its ability to withstand incident exposure or may affect the snug fit necessary to provide adequate protection. This picture shows an arc rated hood. Face shields without an arc rating shall not be used. Eye protection, like safety glasses or goggles, shall always be worn under face shields or hoods. 
Markings of the face shield indicate that the shield itself is not shatterproof and additional protection is necessary. This image shows a face shield indicating need for additional impact protection for the eyes. Heavy duty leather footwear or dielectric footwear or both provide some arc flash protection to the feet and shall be used in all exposures greater than 4 cows. Footwear with an arc rating is not available. Normally the employee's feet are less exposed than the hands or head due to the proximity of most tasks. However, employees should not wear footwear made from lightweight materials or from materials that are flammable or may melt and drip. In most cases, heavy duty leather work shoes are satisfactory. Dielectric overshoes, as shown in this picture, may be used over heavy duty footwear. Clothing and other apparel such as hard hat liners and hairnets made from materials that do not meet the requirements regarding melting or made from materials that do not meet the flammability requirements shall not be permitted to be worn. Apparel made from materials that are not arc rated must not be worn. For instance, hairnets, ear warmers, or head covers could melt onto an employee's hair and the head unless they are made of arc rated material. Arc rated apparel should be inspected before each use. Work clothing or arc flash shoots that are contaminated or damaged to the extent that their protective qualities are impaired shall not be used. Protective items that become contaminated with grease, oil, or flammable liquids or combustible materials shall not be used. Any flammable soiling or contamination on the surface of the arc rated clothing can reduce or even void the arc rating of the apparel. The clothing must also be free from tears, cuts, or rips. Garments that are not suitable for use must be removed from service. If corrections can be made, such as laundering or repair, using the appropriate techniques, the garment can be returned to service, otherwise the garment should be disposed of. The manufacturer's laundry care instructions are a required element of the labeling of any arc flash garment. Improper laundering or failure to follow the instruction provided by the manufacturer may diminish the longevity of the product's useful life and reduce the product's protective qualities. Arc rated apparel shall be stored in a manner that prevents physical damage. Damage from moisture, dust, or other deteriorating agents, or contamination from flammable or combustible materials. Use Table 130.7C15A to identify arc flash PPE category for AC systems, or Table 130.7C15B to identify arc flash PPE category for DC systems. Once PPE categories have been identified, use Table 130.7C15C to list the requirements for PPE based on the arc flash PPE categories 1 through 4. This clothing and equipment shall be used when working within the arc flash boundary. Employees shall use insulated tools or handling equipment or both when working inside the restricted approach boundary of exposed energized electrical conductors or circuit parts where tools or handling equipment might make unintentional contact. Insulated tools shall be protected from damage to the insulating material. Insulated tools shall be rated for the voltages on which they are used. Insulated tools and equipment shall be inspected prior to each use. The inspection shall look for damage to the insulation or damage that can limit the tool from performing its intended function or could increase the potential for an incident. For example, a damaged tip on a screwdriver. The term insulated means that the tools manufacturer has assigned a voltage rating to the insulating material. Only tools with a defined voltage rating are considered to be insulated. It is important for employees to look at the markings on the tool before using it. Tools with unmarked rubber grips and plastic handles must not be used in lieu of a properly rated tool. Fuse or fuse holder handling equipment insulated for the circuit voltage shall be used to remove or install a fuse if the fuse terminals are energized. Replacing fuses live is energized work and, as such, must be justified. Before excavation starts where there exists a reasonable possibility of contacting electrical lines or equipment, the employer shall take the necessary steps to contact the appropriate owners or authorities to identify and mark the location of the electrical lines or equipment. When it has been determined that a reasonable possibility of contact electrical lines and equipment exist, appropriate safe work practices and PPE shall be used during the excavation. Marking the location of underground conductors and equipment will help to minimize the possibility of accidental contact with buried electrical conductors during the excavation. All underground utilities, including gas, electricity, telephone, and cable TV companies, are members of 811. The call center notifies utility companies of excavation work near their underground installations and directs them to mark the appropriate location of underground lines, pipes, and cables. There is a legal obligation in some states for a call to be made to 811 prior to excavation work. An electrical work environment consists of three interrelated components, installation, maintenance, and safe work practices. Safe work practices are most effective when the installation is code compliant and the equipment is maintained appropriately. 
the NFPA documents that address each are aspects are NFPA 70, National Electric Code, NFPA 70B, Recommended Practice for Electrical Equipment Maintenance, and NFPA 70E, Standard for Electrical Safety in the Workplace. A companion document for NFPA 70E is NFPA 70B. The purpose of this recommended practice is to reduce hazards to life and property that can result from failure or malfunction of industrial type electrical equipment systems and equipment. It provides guidance on maintenance practices and on setting up a preventative maintenance program. NFPA 70B applies to preventive maintenance for electrical, electronic, and communication systems and equipment and is not intended to duplicate or supersede instructions that manufacturers normally provide. Good housekeeping is an important characteristic of a safe work environment. Storage that blocks access or egress or prevents safe work practices must be avoided at all times. The area must not be used for storage, including the storage of movable items such as push carts or trash bins. Maintaining adequate access is essential for an employee to operate the equipment in a safe and efficient manner. The primary intent of providing egress from the area is so that, in the event of an emergency such as an arc flash incident, the employee can escape. Items including toolboxes, parts shipping containers, or hand carts must not be placed in your path of egress. In order to protect employees from contact with energized electrical components, all covers and doors must be closed and latched using all fasteners provided with the equipment. All unused openings, other than those intended for the operation of equipment or those as part of the design, must be closed to afford protection substantially equivalent to the wall of the equipment. Some panel boards are equipped with a dead front cover and outer trim. The trim has a hinged door that provides access to the circuit breakers without exposing any live parts. Removing the trim exposes the gutter space. Although the breaker terminals are not visible with the trim removed, they are capable of being inadvertently touched and are considered exposed. Article 320 of the NFPA 70E identifies work practices associated with installation and maintenance of batteries containing many cells, such as those used with uninterruptible power supplies, telecommunication systems, and unit substation DC power systems. Working with batteries can expose an employee to both potential shock and arc flash hazards. A person's body might react to contact with DC voltage differently than from contact with AC voltage. Batteries can also expose an employee to hazards associated with chemical electrolyte used in the battery. Battery charging can sometimes generate flammable gases, so it's important for the employee to avoid anything that could cause open flame or sparks. The employee must consider exposure to these hazards when selecting work practices and PPE. Batteries are sources of energy. Therefore, isolating the source of voltage from a cell is not possible. Working on a battery system is always considered energized electrical work. Personnel shall not wear electrically conductive objects such as jewelry while working on a battery system. The following protective equipment shall be available to employees performing any type of service on a battery with liquid electrolyte. Goggles and face shield appropriate for the electrical hazards and the chemical hazard. Gloves and aprons appropriate for the chemical hazards. Portable or stationary eye wash facilities and equipment within the work area that are capable of drenching and flushing the eyes and body for the duration necessary to mitigate injury from the electrolyte. These requirements only apply if electrolyte is being handled, which is possible only with batteries utilizing free flow liquid electrolyte. Activities in which electrolyte is being handled would include acid adjustment, removal of excess electrolyte, or cleanup of electrolyte leak or spill. Most battery maintenance activities do not involve handling of electrolyte. Electrical safety program principles include, but are not limited to, the following. Inspecting and evaluating the electrical equipment, maintaining the electrical equipment's insulation and enclosure integrity, planning every job and document first-time procedures, de-energizing if possible, anticipating unexpected events, identifying the electrical hazards and reduce the associated risk, protecting employees from shock, burn, blast, and other hazards due to the working environment, using the right tools for the job, assessing people's abilities, and auditing the principles.